What's going on everybody? In today's video, we are checking out another Stevie Ray Vaughan interview. This time, I believe it's from 1986 because they're talking about the Live Alive record, which came out in 86, so in late 86. So I think that's when this is from. That's my guess. Um, it's the Lost interview. It's 15 minutes long, something like that. We're going to check it out. I'm definitely psyched about it. I liked watching the other previous interview that I watched of his. Yeah, so hopefully you did too. All right, if you're new here, please subscribe. Check out my videos. I got all kinds of videos. I got reaction videos, 9 a.m., and I do one at 4 p.m. with my wife every day. I got bass play alongs, live performances, bands, musician tips, all kinds of videos. Definitely check it out. In the description below, Amazon affiliate links to all things Stevie Ray Vaughan and all kinds of other things, including information, links. Definitely check it out. All right, since this is long, let's just do this. <laughs> Bam. Stevie Ray Vaughan. Mm. Look at uh, that. Tell me about your Bolo. <laughs> tell me about your new album. Well, your most recent album. Uh, what live was live. conceptualized in it? Yeah. Uh, we've been wanting to do a, an album with the crowd for quite some time. That we basically cut live in the studio anyway. But um, we've been wanting to pretty much actually bring the crowd in the studio. But we decided it might be easier to cut an album. <laughs> go somewhere where the, f the facilities are, are good enough to do an album at where the crowd could already be. <laughs> you know? uh, and so we ended up using uh, a video portion of of uh, Montreux Jazz Festival in 75 and mm. we, did a sh we did two shows in Austin that were ridiculous length. They were about five hour shows. Oh my god. Hours. And uh, and then we had uh, one show in Dallas that's all all of July's, uh, July the 18th of 75 and July the 17th and 19th of 86. Mm, so that's quite a compilation of, of yes. pieces. That's insane. Um, it, it's really strange. The more I talk to your manager, the more information I'm getting fed about you. Um, he enlightened me to the fact that you were the first white person to ever win the Blues Award. Uh -huh. How, just how did that come up? I, what did that do to you? I mean, that said what to you? Well, of course it felt good, but the main thing is is that it, the music is the music, you know? And yeah. just because I'm white or just because there's, we got to take the color out of the blues, you know? It's just yeah. that I, I like to do the best of the music that I can, and that's, that's where my heart lies, is in the, in the blues, rhythm, blues, and rock and roll. It, it's strange. A, a lot of times people think that, that the blues is, is primarily a, a black art form, and as you said, we've got to take the color well, out. Well, its roots its roots are there. Believe. Right. But you have brought it to another level where it's it's a people music now. Yeah. It, it's, not a, it's not a color music. Um, your background, I mean, the blues initially was coming out of hard luck and bad times and just an overall depressed state. Mm -hmm. Your background, how much did that play in, in your going into the blues? There was a lot of rough things going on. But um, hopefully, I've grown past some of those things. You know, self self inflicted a lot of it. Um, nowadays, I'm I'm drug free, alcohol free. For a long time, no, I wasn't. About 25 years, and I'm just trying to work through some of those problems and and grow from them, grow from those mistakes. Were those dependencies? They say the music business fosters those things. Were these inner turmoils with you, or was it part of the whole scheme of things? Well, I wasn't on the road when it started, you know, yeah. obviously. I'm 32 now. Yeah, so it's been for 25 six, years. Seven or eight years old, you know. Oh my God. Um, That's insane. The, the, this business, the scheduling of it, can call for, can mm -hmm. call for needed, some people to see, at least think that they need artificial energy. Yeah. Or not thinking about something sedate themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of that, a lot of that comes with the image of rock and roll and, mm -hmm. and playing music. Um, regardless of all that, it still ends up where it's not necessary. It really isn't. Yeah. Do you feel as though your music is better now than it was when you were under the influence? Yeah, there was, you know, of course, of course for a long time I thought that was the solution. You know, I found that it was a problem. <laughs> you know, uh, I think I think we're, our music's a lot clearer now. I really do. I feel a lot better inside. I know that.
You've got quite a following of superstars and other musicians. Uh, how did you come to pick Stevie Wonder's Superstition? I've always liked Stevie Wonder and I've always liked his music. And I've just ended, just ended up with that song. We were playing with it one day at, a, at Soundcheck. None of us knew, I didn't know the words or anything. I just knew very superstitious, you know, I'd sing that over and over. <laughs> and uh, we, we just ended up, we ended up trying it and, and uh, one of the stage crew uh, had, had said, if we do that, man, it'll be a hit, you know? And it felt real good. So we just, we just worked on it and come to find out we had approval from Stevie Wonder, you know? And, and that was quite a thrill. We did the mixing and the mastering at his studio at Wonderland. Yeah. Let's talk about your HBO special. That's another thing that's coming up. That was a lot of fun, yeah. Um, who's in it and uh, when might it air and what can we expect from you in it? Well, that was a, uh, a wonderful day. It was a wonderful day. B.B. King, Albert King, Dr. John, the late Paul Butterfield, Eric Clapton, um, Phil Collins, Chaka Khan, Gladys Knight, Etta James, Billy Ocean, BB's band. Sometimes all of us at once, sometimes sometimes not all of us at once, but uh, God, it was a wonderful experience. It really was. We set, the way it was set up was all the musicians and their equipment faced each other. So we actually played to each other. And the audience was there on the outside of, of, around, the, around the stage, the circular stage. And I don't know, I just had a blast being with all those people and doing my best with them. Uh, it comes out, I believe, in August. Um, it'll be a hot one. I, I can believe it. You've also got uh, a movie that's happening, uh, Back to the Beach. Why don't you tell me a little about that? Uh, well, I play myself playing me. <laughs> <laughs> what? You know, it's, all I Dick do is Dale? I'm, I'm in it, um, playing Pipeline with Dick Dale, the guy who invented surf music. And uh, he's gotten a little wilder. Surf music. And uh, through the years, what? and uh, I don't know, it was a lot of fun doing. It was a lot of fun doing, and it was, you know, it, it came about because of a guy, Frank Mancuso, the producer, had uh, had kept asking about me doing this, and up until a that movie. point, because of some uh, problems from the past, I had uh, I had a reputation for being kind of ornery, you know, and uh. a little a little weird to work with in the studio because I like to do it all night long. <laughs> And they have mm. sessions during the day too. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so, but he kept insisting on on contacting me about it, and, and thank God he did because I had the chance to, you know, not only not only have fun doing it, but to show that that I'd changed a lot of my ways. You think you'd want to? Oh, that was more or less of a cameo role, let's say. Yes. You think you'd want to be an upfront actor? I mean, a lot of musicians make that transition. That would be fun if if I find that it's that I'm capable of doing that. Well, I mean, you obviously have the presence and, and, and the talent, so yeah. I mean, what do you think? It's, well, uh, it would just have to, I'd just have to see how it goes. I've never had, had any acting lessons or, or anything like that. You know, I don't know exactly what, you know, how to go about it. You know, I might be convincing in some ways, but then that might be some ways. <laughs> um, you were discovered by uh, Mick Jagger and Keith Richards. Well, mm -hmm. actually, I was discovered by my mama. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And we're going to get to her. Second time we've heard that now. When you were, yeah. had a little fall off the stage, and uh, she was right there with yeah. you through it. You know, that's what mom's all about, though. Yeah. Um, but they credit you as being probably one of the greatest guitarists of all times. Well, I keep trying to be. I keep trying to be. I don't know that I am. I just know that I do the best that I can. The best that you can is, is, is absolutely phenomenal. I, I keep going back to it, but again, it's, uh, that sound check was awesome. All right. Um, let's talk about some of the bad times for just a, a, a quick minute. How long were you uh, under the influence, and what exactly made you said 25 years. Well, it was, a, it was over a period of about 25 years that uh, in one form or another I was you know, drinking or using something. And uh, it got to the point where finally, I knew for, I knew for quite a while that I, could, that I had a problem with things like that, with, with drugs and alcohol. But it was at this also at the same, it was, it was, I knew that I had a problem, but I couldn't stop. And I knew that I couldn't stop. Every time that I had 
more pressure seemed to be a good excuse for more. And every time there was less pressure, it was party time. Those, that's the disease telling you that you don't have it. You know, oh, sure, you can, come on, you can make it, you know. And uh, what happened was I ended up finally, I, kn I saw it coming too. I knew it was coming. Finally, I had a, every kind of breakdown at once that I think a person could have. Physically, emotionally, spiritually, and the whole ball of wax melted. <laughs> and I woke up on a bus. Well, I'd, actually, I I'd, I'd had a nervous breakdown and had to go to the hospital first. Got out of there. We were in, in a German hospital, and they, these people, I don't know if it was common in Germany or if it was just this particular hospital, they were butchers. You know, and. Uh, didn't care what you said when they asked you questions, you know, and thank God I had my bass player Tommy Shannon and a few other people I knew with me uh, to keep me from trying to jump up and run out, you know, because it didn't seem any safer there. That's why I went to the hospital. <laughs> then the next day, I woke up on a bus uh, crying, scared of everything, didn't know why, didn't know what I was scared of, much less how to deal with it. And that went on for quite some time until we were, it was just obvious that I could not keep going. And went and saw Dr. Victor Bloom in London. He put me in London Clinic, which is a private, private hospital. I did detox there. And we also checked out my stomach because I was having some struggle problems, possible ulcers. And it was just, it come to find out it was just, there was, he said my stomach looked like a 65 year old man. Uh, after, after I left that hospital, I was in London for three or four days, I guess, and came back to, to the States, went and checked in immediately to a uh, charter Peachford Hospital in Atlanta. I was there for about a month. And what that place did not only is a, is a good place to be away from, the, uh, away from the drugs, you know, you do clean out that way, but it not only taught us, it not only got, got us dried out, all of the people that were in there and that have gone through them before, but it gives you, it teaches you a set of tools. Um, well, if you just dry up, you might as well just, you know, all you're doing then is white knuckling it and just, you know, on your own willpower, it's not going to work. You know, willpower has nothing to do with this. A lot of people think, why do I need to stop? It's not that easy. There is a, it's actually a disease, alcoholism. And addiction is a disease, and it it's it's a disease that tells it's the only disease that I know of that part of it is that the disease actually tells you you don't have it. It's okay to it's okay to have one, and one is the one that gets you messed up. All the rest of them don't matter. <laughs> the first one, the first one starts. See, there's a there's it's not only a mental it's not only a mental um, obsession to use, it's, a, it's also a physical craving that goes on. It's, um, what it is is that your body can no longer break down these things. It's alcohol, it no longer breaks it down at the same rate that a normal drinker could. A normal drinker gets, they drink two or three drinks and feel like they've had enough. What happens in my body, being an alcoholic, is that it doesn't break it down properly so that the levels of acetone that your body breaks down the last stage don't get broken down and it sets up, it causes a craving for more. And of course that starts the obsession. And once you take another one, you have a higher level of acetone that causes a bigger craving. And for me, I was drinking, one drink for me was about three or four for most people. And if I had two or three drinks, I felt like I just had, you know, nothing. <laughs> and it just made me want to start. Mm -hmm. you know? And it was, it's, it's not a good thing, you know, it's not a good thing to, to live that way, only on the wagon. Uh, because there's anything can tip you off, anything can give you a, your mind a reason to think that it's, you know, I deserve a drink, or after that, who wouldn't want one, you know? And it's that first one, the set of tools 
help us help us to realize that we don't have a power over alcohol or drugs. We don't have the show, see, and it takes it'll. What happens is these tools teach you how to uh, realize that 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 is the symptom. The, actually, the drugs and alcohol are a symptom of the disease. The disease is actually the problems that we had beforehand. That's why staying dry is not enough. Because the problems that we were stuffing and ignoring are what gets us if we don't treat it. Right. Right, let's move on to a, a little brighter point. That's history. You're better. You're, you're like you said, it's behind you. You've been a pre. Why well, didn't they just close up to his world. hands like that? To Carnegie Hall. What do you think your overall appeal to the mass public is? Um, that I do the best <laughs> I can to play what I really like, and it's honest. Um, what has inspired you throughout? Through who? Who is your your Elsa Um My brother Jimmy Vaughn, who is a, he, he's the reason I got started, and he's also the inspiration for a lot, a lot of musicians. Um, and because of him, I was I was able to hear BB King, Freddie King, Albert Collins, Albert King, Lonnie Mac, Buddy Guy, Muddy Waters, Howlin' Wolf, Kenny Burrell, Jimmy Smith, on and on. I don't know. And they're all very big influences. Okay. I think we're going to have to cut it short. Wow. Okay. All right. Wow. That was a lot on his addictions. Wow. Okay. That was really cool. You know, something that I think about a lot how, with all these things when I watch, whether it's like interviews or like so many of the live performances, is I'm just glad that we got the footage. <laughs> <laughs> you know, because so much of history has not been video recorded or audio recorded or recorded at all, you know, like it was just written. So, you know, I'm very glad that we have video because you're not taking the guy out of context, you know, like you're getting exactly what he's saying. You're hearing it from him and we got it. So I'm always grateful for that. I think it's amazing. Yeah, they didn't talk like that much about the record. I wish they talked a little bit more about the record. Five hours? A five hour gig? Like five hours they were playing. Have I played for five hours straight on a gig? Not straight, but maybe, maybe. There is one or two, now that I think about it, there's one or two gigs I did that were weddings actually that they just kept hitting us for overtime. They kept hitting us for overtime. And it was a great payday, but it was a long. It was super long. Five hours is a long time to have an instrument on your back. <laughs> like that, like in performance mode. That's a long time. Now practicing, that's not, I've practiced over five hours in a day a zillion times, you know, when I'm in my teens and 20s. <laughs> but, even still, you're not, I don't have to stand for that. I can sit, you know, and like practice, practice. But when you're gigging in gig mode, oh boy, that's tough. That's really tough. Five hours. Whew. Wow. Yeah, I caught that. Whew. Yeah. And then all the drug and alcohol stuff. That was very interesting. His experience. You know, everybody's got a different experience who goes through all that kind of thing. Not everybody has the availability of going to a clinic for a month. <laughs> but yeah, that's cool. You know, hearing him talk about all that. That was very interesting. And it's interesting that back then even they were talking about it as a disease. Because I feel like that's more... Not everybody talks about it like that. And not everybody... I feel like that's more a recent thing, but apparently not. That's why I'm bringing it up. Because I'm like, wow... You know, some people, you know, there are people that call it a disease, but not everybody calls it or even thinks about it that way, even today. Yep, pretty interesting. Yeah, and his whole, since eight, seven or eight years old, oh my God, what was going on in his house? Yeesh, that's gnarly. Yeah, that sounds bad. I mean, I can't imagine, <laughs> I can't, I can't imagine seven or eight. I started playing the, st playing music at eight. When did he start playing guitar? That's a good question that I don't know the answer to. Someone I'm sure will, will tell me and uh, maybe someone has put it in comments before and I just am not remembering it right now. Whew, Jesus. Yeah, that's gnarly. Aside from that, I mean, you know, he looks great. <laughs> I mean, by this time, what, he had been sober. When did he get sober? 
84, 85, was it? 85? 85? I'm not remembering that either. Anyways, it was cool. Good to watch. Like digging these interviews. See, the interviews and live performances, that's where it's at for me. I mean, recordings, you know, recordings are great, obviously. Recordings are amazing, but this stuff is really fantastic and cool, too. Anyways, all right, this is super long, and um, you guys caught all the good stuff. So, so yeah, thanks for watching. If you're new here, please subscribe. Check out my videos. I got all kinds of videos, reaction videos, 9 a.m., and I do one at 4 p.m. with my wife every day. I got bass play lines, live performances, advanced musician tips, all kinds of videos. Definitely check it out. In the description below, Amazon affiliate links to all things Stevie Ray Vaughan and lots of other links and information in the description. Definitely check it out. Thanks for watching. I'll catch you in the next video.